Join me as we pray for illumination. God of mystery and of might, you who spoke to Moses from the burning bush, speak to us now in the reading and proclaiming of your word that we might hear what it is that you are saying to us. Amen. So as Sophie mentioned, we're continuing our story Uh, With Moses in Exodus today, we're reading from the third chapter using the voice translation. And so this is Moses all grown up. He's left his hometown of Egypt, and uh, for reasons we'll get to in just a moment, we'll hear why he is a shepherd now. And he's settled into that current job, and that's where we pick up with our scripture this morning. Now one day when Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he guided the flock far away from its usual pastures to the other side of the desert and came to a place known as Horeb, where the mountain of God stood. There the special messenger of the Eternal appeared to Moses in a fiery blaze from within the bush. Moses looked again at the bush as it blazed, but to his amazement, the bush did not burn up in flames. Moses said to himself, why is this bush not burning up? I need to move a little closer to get a better look at this amazing sight. When the Eternal One saw Moses approach the burning bush to observe it more closely, he called out to him from within the bush, saying, Moses, Moses. Moses replied, I'm right here. The Eternal One said, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals and stand barefoot on the ground in my presence, for this ground is holy ground. I am the true God, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A feeling of dread and awe rushed over Moses. He hid his face because he was afraid he might catch a glimpse of the true God. The Eternal One said, I have seen how my people in Egypt are being mistreated. I have heard their groaning when the slave drivers torment and harass them, for I know well their suffering. I have come to rescue them from the oppression of the Egyptians, to lead them from that land where they are slaves, and to give them a good land, a wide open space flowing with milk and honey. The land is currently inhabited by Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. The plea of Israel's children has come before me, and I have observed the cruel treatment they have suffered by Egyptian hands. So go, I'm sending you back to Egypt as my messenger to Pharaoh. I want you to gather my people, the children of Israel, and bring them out of Egypt. Moses said to God, Who am I to confront Pharaoh and lead Israel's children out of Egypt? The Eternal One said, Do not fear, Moses. I will be with you every step of the way, and this will be the sign to you that I am the one who has sent you. After you have led them out of Egypt, you will return to this mountain and worship God. Moses replied, Let's say I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your fathers has sent me to rescue you. And then they reply, What is his name? What should I tell them then? The Eternal One said, I am who I am. This is what you should tell the people of Israel. I am has sent me to rescue you. This is what you are to tell Israel's people. The eternal, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is the one who has sent me to you. This is my name forevermore. And this is the name by which all future generations shall remember me. 
Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes I wonder if I should be allowed to continue calling myself Southern. I've lived in three states in my life, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. I would say that's about as Southern as you can get. I'm getting a thumbs up. (laughs) But there are some parts of Southern culture that I guess just never took. For example, grits. I mean, who tasted grits one day and said, hey, this has absolutely no flavor. you got to try this. I also don't think that I'll ever be able to truly appreciate watching NASCAR after living in Atlanta for three years. That provided more than enough experience of watching cars go around in a circle and crash into each other on 285. But above all, There is one thing that lots of Southerners do that I'm not sure I'll ever be able to appreciate. And that is walking around barefoot. Some of you people even do that outside. It honestly blows my mind how anybody can stand it. For as long as I can remember, I have never liked anyone or anything touching my feet. I don't even like touching my own feet. I'd rather go to the dentist than have a pedicure. That's how strongly I feel about it. And the same goes for being barefoot. I cannot stand that sensation. I do not walk around barefoot in my own house, and I certainly don't walk around outside without shoes on. Between the hot pavement, the sharp rocks, the sand that somehow gets between my toes, even though we are nowhere near the ocean, All of it is just too much. My grandmother was a nurse, and to this day I can still hear her voice whenever I'm faced with the prospect of not wearing shoes outside. There are two words that she said to me that I will never be able to forget for as long as I'm alive. They are foot fungus. If ever I was going on an overnight trip somewhere, that might have public showers, you can be sure my grandmother reminded me of the importance of shower shoes because, again, foot fungus. You don't know who was in that shower before you, and you don't know what you might pick up when you're in there. So having been raised on the dangers of foot fungus, to this day I cannot comprehend how my wife has absolutely no problem with being barefoot. I think she would be content to never wear shoes again if she didn't have to. She even takes her shoes off in the car, y'all. What? My aversion to being barefoot even goes so far that I do not count sandals as being real shoes. I mean, flip-flops? I might as well be wearing two napkins on my feet. The only way that I will be exposed at all is by wearing chacos like I'm doing today out of necessity because it does get hot here in Georgia in August. Chacos are as close as I like to get to being barefoot because they securely wrap around my feet so I have more protection. And unlike flip-flops, I don't have to consciously think about keeping them on with every step. I really just don't have the mental endurance to keep up with flip-flops. So I'm really glad that it was Moses talking to God on that mountain and not me. Can you imagine how that conversation would have gone? God says, Dana, take off your sandals and stand barefoot on the ground in my presence, for this is holy ground. Uh... Actually, God, if it's all the same with you, I'm going to leave my shoes on. If I take a couple of steps back, I won't be on holy ground anymore, right? We can can still talk while I'm adjacent to holy ground. Somehow I don't think that would have gone over well. But why is it that God asks Moses to take his sandals off in the first place? 
He is standing there on the side of a mountain in the middle of a desert with his flock all around him. So I don't think God is particularly worried about Moses tracking in dirt. What if God is asking Moses to take his shoes off so that Moses will be himself? So that there won't be anything between Moses and God for him to hide behind when he talks face to face with the true God. It takes courage to allow yourself to be vulnerable and open with God. Maybe this was God's way of saying, Moses, I want you to put all of your pretenses and all your defenses aside for a moment. We need to have a real conversation. Don't put up any walls or barriers. You don't need any protection from me. And it is true. They're about to have a very real and uncomfortable conversation. At least that's how Moses feels about it anyway. Because let's remember for a second how Moses came to be a shepherd in the first place. He's tending his father-in-law's flock in the middle of nowhere because he ran away from Egypt. He murdered an Egyptian soldier for beating an Israelite. And when Pharaoh found out, he wanted Moses killed. So Moses ran away from his home and from his people. And now God is saying, out of all the people in the world, I'm calling on you to go back to that very place that you fled from. And you're going to be my messenger to Pharaoh, telling him to liberate the Israelites, a message that he would probably kill somebody just for saying out loud. So knowing all of that, I can understand why Moses is reluctant to say yes. Moses responds, who am I to confront Pharaoh and lead Israel's children out of Egypt? And I think this might be why God asked Moses to take his shoes off. God is asking Moses to step out of his comfort zone, out of his current role as a shepherd, so that he can instead tend to God's flock. God is not asking Moses to be someone he's not. God isn't asking Moses whether or not he thinks he's up to the challenge. God is telling Moses, be yourself. Don't be afraid about what's about to happen, because I will be with you every step of the way. And that feeling of being vulnerable in God's presence, Moses was going to have to get used to that following God's calling, standing up to Pharaoh, leading God's people to freedom. Those are all going to make Moses feel a lot more exposed than just walking around without sandals. And as much as it pains me to admit it, when I follow God's calling on my life today, It feels a lot like walking around without shoes on. I feel exposed. I worry about my next steps. Sometimes even the walk itself can be uncomfortable. I think a lot of disciples today have wrestled with the uncomfortable steps God has asked us to take. Many of us have probably wondered if we're up to the challenge. We have said to God, Who am I? Who am I to volunteer to lead this group, to take on this new ministry, to teach others, to stand up for what's right, because God asked me to? We ask that a lot, don't we? Lord, who am I to do this for you? And God responds to our question in the same way that he did with Moses. By saying, do not be afraid. I'm not asking you to do something you cannot do. Just be yourself. And I will be with you every step of the way. And if that doesn't completely alleviate your fears, then the next part of Moses' conversation with God is intended just for you. 
Because clearly that answer didn't satisfy Moses either. Moses says, so hypothetically, let's say I do go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your fathers has sent me to rescue you. And then they reply, what is his name? What should I tell them then? Moses' first question was, who am I? His next question is, who are you? Who are you that the Israelites would even believe that you have the power to free them? And God responds with what might be my favorite reply in all of Scripture. God says, who am I? I am who I am. That is who you can tell the people of Israel has sent me to you. It is bad enough when we doubt our God-given talents by asking, who am I, to be able to do what God is asking me. But the moment we start to doubt whether God can do what he has told us that he is going to do, well, then we are rightly going to be called out. So if Moses is saying, tell me your name, perhaps what he's really asking is, do you have any proof to back up this wild promise to free all the Israelites. Some names carry a lot of weight. For example, everyone knows the power of a name like Pharaoh. So what name should I tell the people that you go by? And to that God says, my name is I am who I am. Another way to translate that is I will be who I will be. God is telling Moses, I am so powerful that not even my name can be defined. I am whoever I want to be. And I am is in control here, not Pharaoh. So if the Israelites want to know my name, you tell them this, I am who I am. I am the eternal God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And I am is the name by which all future generations will remember me. After that fiery exchange at the burning bush, I think I would be looking for my sandals and maybe my eyebrows. We need to trust that God is going to do what God is going to do, even when Pharaoh seems to think that he's in charge. And we need to trust that if God calls on us, it is for good reason. God does not expect us to be the next Abraham, the next Isaac, or the next Jacob, or Moses. God wants you to take your shoes off and just be you. God will be who God will be. And as God's children, the great I am says to us, go wherever I send you. For where you are going, sandals are not required. But being yourself is. Let us pray. Holy One, lead us out from what we hide behind so that we can walk in the light with you by our side. In Christ's name, amen.